Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. And coming up on today's episode... It's so funny. At a very early age, I knew there was an outlet, and I knew that was on a movie set. And I think that drives me every day into waking up and everything, that I know I'll feel most comfortable on a set. Um, I'd say the most surreal was... Um, the most upsetting was, uh, uh, you know, and I wasn't in the, I wasn't, you know, in Hollywood when it happened. I was in college, but when River Phoenix passed away, that was, uh, that was uh, tragic, insane. Um, uh, still not over it. <laughs> FYI, prisoners who are sending my wife mail, um, I read it. I never give it to my wife. Uh, <laughs> it sort of is pretty exciting for me. I really feel like I'm. Uh, Reading, reading into something I shouldn't be reading. Um, there's a takeaway from this podcast. Uh, I read my wife's prison fan mail. If you're one to pay attention to Hollywood tabloids, you'd know that it's fairly rare for a child actor to keep their career thriving into adulthood. Well, one versatile star who was in his first hit film at 11 years old has thrived for decades as an actor though he's also pivoted into the world of talk and game show hosting. But despite the many roles and successes he has raked up in his 40-year career, his most important role is being a dad to daughters. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Join me with today's guest, Jerry O'Connell. My brother and my brother-in-law uh, both told me that we need some kind of a sign-off for this podcast. Yeah, I think because... Kameko with a K. I think it's got to be something with K. Like, uh, K, everybody. Catch ya later. I think catch is spelled with a C. I know, but you spell it with a K and you do like a, you do like a Chiron. Like, uh, Chiron, there's a K. That's a C, too. Oh, well, no. I mean, we're using Ks today. We're replacing all the Cs with Ks. Um, how are you, Jerry? Doing well. So good to see you. Good to see you, too. There's our sign on. You just came over from the talk. I've, I've been hosting the talk uh, on CBS every day, Eastern, um, 2 p.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Um, a live show. I can't believe I'm a talk show host. When I moved to Hollywood, you were the talk show host guy no, and I was kinda. the actor. And uh, here I am um, talk show hosting. But I mean, I think it, I think it uh, plays into the theme of your show still here. Um it's funny careers. You don't. Uh, you have no control over them. They I moved away to go. Chicago, and I've been gone for twenty years. And when Jim called me and said, "Hey, I have an idea for a podcast," and he asked me if I would be interested in hosting, and I missed Los Angeles a lot. You know, moving to Chicago was moving home, and I went back for my parents who were elderly. Mm -hmm. But uh, I did miss it. it. It's it's different out here. It's special. Yeah, it is. I um. I moved out here right after college. Um, I, uh, I I moved out here in the late 1990s. I gotta tell you, the thing that inspired me most to move out to Los Angeles, I truly believe, was Three's Company. I grew up watching Three's Company. I was obsessed with Jack, Chrissy, and Janet, and um, uh, they lived in Santa Monica. They hung out at the Regal Beagle. Um, they rode uh, 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 tandem bicycles up and down Venice Boulevard. I just wanted to move to Los Angeles. I, I just, uh, I just wanted to move out here. They make it look so nice. <laughs> they really do. But you know what? It is, um, it is really nice. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think you're having a pretty mild winter this winter, but um, I mean, the weather is really the best. Um, and it's better than the Southeast, Florida, any of it. I mean, it's not too cold in the winter. It's, I guess, a little warm in the summer, but not as hot as it is in the... And there's always a breeze. It seems like you always have an ocean breeze. Yeah, and, and, and I'm, uh, I'm really into it. The funny thing is I have children now who are teenagers, and um, we live in the valley, which, um, for those who aren't familiar, is sort of like the, the suburb of... Of Los Angeles, and um, uh, I mean, if you're my age, you remember sort of Valley Girls who sort of like talk like this, and um, 
I have two daughters who talk like this now. <laughs> and it's so crazy to me because they really speak with this accent. <laughs> and, you know, I think now there's more of like what they call vocal fry, which is, I mean, it's what my children do. And it is a valley accent. And it, uh, it drives me insane. Does it? it Are does. you a dad who says, don't say that? Uh, no, don't I yell at them. I say, don't talk. To, shut up. <laughs> I hate that. Do not speak like that. That's not how we speak. Speak normally. Project. Like, pronounce your, like, don't do that long thing. And pronounce the end of the word, damn it. But they, uh, they're they going to do whatever the heck they're going to do. Um, it is pretty funny. When they do go to the East Coast and spend some time with my family, um for a little bit, they do sort of pick up a little bit of a New York accent where they talk like this a little bit, you know, where they uh, say things like coffee and stuff, and that that sort of makes me laugh. But um, yeah, I have uh, I have Valley Girls for children. How do you like being a dad? I like it a lot. It really is. Um, it, it it's so funny. I was thinking about parenthood. Um, the movie? No, I was thinking about parenthood. Uh, I was watching, uh, this is, uh, we're really going off topic here. My wife and I love a show called 90 Day Fiance, which is a reality show on, I believe, TLC. I'm sorry if I'm wrong about that, but uh, it's on TLC. Who knows what anything is on anymore? Yeah. Uh, it just it just ends up in your inbox. Um, and um, there's a young couple on there who is, uh, is expecting and... Uh, it's a guy who's marrying a girl from uh, from the Far East uh, because the whole point of 90 Day Fiance is that it's Americans who meet people online overseas and then they meet up with each other and they have 90 days to figure out whether they're going to get married or not to get what they call a K-1 visa. And they're expecting and they said, are you excited? And he went, you know, I don't think anybody is ever ready or really like is like excited to have kids i think it just sort of happens and that's exactly what i went through it was funny i'm really grateful to my wife who um i don't want to say made me have kids but it was really her, her pushing me i would have i was trying to push it off as long as possible and um i'm really happy i had kids it is it is fun um it's to me the uh it's the most fun i've had um, which I'm a little shocked at. Um, now it's not fun um, as like going to I don't know an outdoor music festival or uh, doing drugs and watching the sunrise at the Grand Canyon or the uh, uh, skinny dipping in Machu Picchu. Like that's actually fun. Um, it isn't fun when your teenage girls are yelling at you and complaining why you're late picking them up. That's not fun, but um, it has kind of uh, completed me. Really, it's uh, it's um, it's um, it's the most fun. Really, that sounds like a line from Jerry Maguire. Yeah, I know. I was I was thinking that. I was like, <laughs> oh, I'm plagiarizing, but I was in it, so it's not plagiarism. No, no, it just stuck with you. That's all. You use it now as part of your vernacular. Yeah, I I, I like it, and. Um, you know, one of my daughters has said she wants to get into acting. She's a teenager. Um, you okay with that? Yeah, I, I, I really am. I think acting is. Uh, I think uh, acting, uh, and that's the only thing I really know about showbiz. I mean, I guess I'm a talk show host now, but um, acting is sort of our thing. My wife and I, family business, if you will, um, and. Uh, I think it's really good for young people to get into, like I was. Um, very young. I was very young. I was in Stand By Me when I was 12, you know. Um, I think it's um, I think it's good because it teaches you about rejection really early. And you don't, you audition all the time and you get nothing. And you get, I mean, one percent i don't even know what the percent is point oh oh one percent of every at bat that you get and um i think that's a really healthy thing it just teaches you to be um nimble it teaches you to be um 
not set in what your goals are. I mean, again, teaches getting, you how to be how to take rejection yeah. many times. I mean, again, getting back to the theme of still here, um, it, it teaches you how to sort of move, move and groove with the times. You know, I was looking at clips of uh, Jerry Maguire uh, getting ready for today, and uh, I couldn't. I had. It's been a while since I saw it. Uh, I saw. A, I went to a screening. I remember. I think it was at Columbia Pictures. Yeah, and um, I, I really enjoyed the movie. And then I went on the junket and interviewed Tom and Cuba. And sure. Looking at it, I forgot all the people who were in it. Yeah. You know, Cuba. Yep. Tom. Sure. Renee. Sure, Renee Zellweger. Yeah, who's gone on to win a couple of Oscars. Sure. Uh, Bonnie Hunt. Bonnie Hunt. Jay Moore. What was the young kid, the little boy? Uh, L Jonathan Lipnicki. That's, that's it. Yep. But uh, it it that movie's a classic. Yeah, it was a classic. Uh, it 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 is a classic. I've been really fortunate. I've been a part of um, I mean, a couple of classics. Stand uh, by me is thought of. Stand by me is a be. classic. Yeah. yeah. Jerry Maguire's a classic. I mean, I think it's a classic. Scream Two. Uh, you know, uh, is people still talk about it? They're doing. Uh, the whole cast is doing conventions still to this day, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, people make a living from being in that movie. Um, I've, uh, I've been really fortunate. I had a, uh, I had a hot streak there. For, yes, nice resume. For a minute, yeah. Uh, what do you remember from Stand By Me? Um, I, remember, um, I remember how much fun I had doing it. I remember being... Um, a young adult. I was 11 when we made it. That's young. Um, and I remember pretty much immediately um, realizing that up until that point in my life, uh, everything that I was doing that was getting me in trouble, speaking out in class, uh, speaking out when not being called on, being loud, talking too much, having too much energy, not sitting on my hands... Uh, all those things that I was always getting in trouble for were celebrated on a movie set. Come in with energy. Have more energy. Uh, talk out of turn. Come up with suggestions. Come up with ideas. There are no bad ideas. Um, it was the only place that... Uh, my personality was celebrated up until that point in my life. Um, this is in the mid 80s. So they called me hyperactive. I guess now there's other words for it. Other uh, um, more medically accurate terms. But, ADHD. Uh, yeah. Um, but then they called me hyperactive. And I remember on my dad's bookshelf, he had a book, Why Is Your Child Hyperactive? <laughs> <laughs> it's like some book that I think some coworker gave to him, you know? Like, hey, here you get a uh, kid of yours is crazy. Uh, here's, a, uh, here's a book. I mean, I remember the first day uh, doing a scene. The first day. And it was a scene where we were, the four boys, it's, you know, it's Stand By Me is about four boys who go to look for a dead body. And uh, I remember we were doing one scene where we're in a junkyard and I remember we were doing something and I started um, ad-libbing. I started as my character goofing around a little bit at the end of a take. Something happened and I was goofing around and Rob Reiner yelled cut and started walking right toward me. You know, cut! And he was a big guy. He's, he's, yeah, a, he's, he's a big guy. He's a presence, you know? So, you know, the boss yells cut and starts marching towards set and I was like, oh man goes he's gonna yell at me and say you know hey what are you doing just stay the lines shut up sit on your hands stop talking out of turn and he came to set and he went jerry and i was like oh man here it comes and he went more of that hey fellas you see what he did that's what i need i need more of that just like that every take action and i was celebrated Steve, I was, and it made me realize, wow, I don't have to hide who I am here. I don't, I don't have to change who I am. I don't have to hold anything in. And a lot of the business here in Hollywood is about being celebrated 
and uh, being appreciated. And that helps or your self-confidence. Feeling free, really. Right. Not feeling constrained, you know, in, in life and in, in, in your personality. So it's so funny. At a very early age, I knew there was an outlet and I knew that was on a movie set. And I think that drives me every day into waking up and everything. That I know I'll feel most comfortable on a set. Do you ever run into some of the people you worked with? Yeah. I run into Will Wheaton a lot. I stay in touch with him. I run into Corey Feldman a lot. I stay in touch with him. Uh, Rob Reiner every now and again. I stay in touch with a producer behind the scenes who's one of the founders of Castle Rock, which was the production company that was behind Stand By Me and all those movies that Rob Reiner did uh, back in those days. Misery, um, I think Misery, Misery was one of them. A Few Good Men. I mean, all of them. The list goes on and on. Um, when Harry Met Sally... There's but too many to remember. There's a lot, you know. And uh, there's a guy named Andrew Scheiman that I stay in touch with. Uh, Keeper Sutherland, I love running into him. Uh, he played the bad guy in Stand By Me. Uh, so I stay in touch with everybody. On social media, I stay in touch with the Phoenix family. River Phoenix, who was in Stand By Me, um, mm -hmm. has sisters and a mom. And I stay in touch with them on social media. Um, but it's... Uh, I interviewed him when he was a kid. Wow. Uh, what was the movie he made with Christine Lottie, Judd Hirsch? Running on Empty. That's it. Yeah. yeah, I interviewed him. He was up for an Academy Award. Yes, he was. Yeah. Very talented young man. Very. It's a tragedy. Yeah. Um, what about Jerry Maguire? Um, Jerry Maguire was really um, interesting for me because, uh, you know, I was in Stand By Me. It was a huge hit. I didn't really come from a showbiz family. I didn't, I didn't really come. I didn't have a good, I didn't come from a showbiz family. They didn't, uh, my parents didn't know how to really follow it up after that. You know, um, I'm not complaining. I love my parents. I saw them yesterday. We went to brunch. Hi, mom and dad. You know, you would think that after Stand By Me, that'd be it. A career is made. But I went to college. I went to high school. I went to college. I started doing a lot of commercials in college. I went to college in New York. I went to New York University. And I auditioned for commercials all the time and became quite successful at doing commercials. And uh, you could make a lot of money doing commercials. Mm -hmm. And I really, uh, I earned a pretty good living doing commercials. And um, I wasn't really uh, acting in the, what they call the scripted world, which is movies and TV. And um, I got a television show for Fox at the time. This is at the beginning of Fox when they only did programming, I think, Sunday through Thursday. They didn't have programming Friday, Saturday, or Friday or Saturday nights, you know? And they only had, I guess they still only have two hours of programming. But uh, I did a science fiction show for, um, uh, for uh, Fox at the time. And... Um, I got an agent. I got. I signed with William Morris. Um, it was a big deal. I was back, you know. And um, one of the first auditions that uh, my new William Morris agent got me was uh, for Jerry Maguire to meet Cameron Crowe, who wrote and directed Jerry Maguire. And I auditioned for the agent, who was the agent who fired uh, um the football player and all that stuff. And I was, uh, I was 21, you know, I was young and I, I got along in the audition process as the agent. And I was really just copying my agent at William Morris that I had just <laughs> signed with, who was a pretty fast talking, really good agent. And, um, I, I met Tom Cruise for a screen test. Screen tests are really big deals. They give you a script. You meet Tom Cruise. I mean, that's a huge deal. And when you see Tom Cruise, it's surreal. It's Tom Cruise. And by the way, he looks like Tom Cruise. <laughs> he sounds like Tom Cruise. He feels like Tom Cruise. But you're talking to him. It's almost interactive. This is before AI. So, I mean, it was really um, something special. But I read for it. And physically, you know, I was 20, 22. 21, 22 maybe. Yeah, 22. And there was a role for a recent college graduate, a first, raft, a first 
first number one in the NFL draft pick. And they saw me, and I think physically they thought, um, "There's our man." Yeah, he's just he doesn't look. He looks more like a young athlete than he does like an agent who's a a, a contemporary of uh, of Tom Cruise's, you know. And when I read as the agent part in the screen test, I just felt like it wasn't like it, no one was laughing. There were other producers in the room and it just didn't click. And I remember I was waiting out by the car, by my valet. I rented a car and I remember thinking, wow, that didn't go well. I, I didn't get that. You could just feel it. And an assistant came out and said, hey, will you come back in? And so, of course, I ran back in and I thought they were going to say, hey, that didn't go well. Let's try a couple other. And they said, will you read this part? And they gave me and in acting, they call it cold sides. So it's like a cold script. So you haven't rehearsed it. But it's funny. I knew as an actor, when you got a cold script, that was a real opportunity because there were zero expectations on you. You know, you didn't have time to prepare. So you could read lines. And basically, when you got a cold script, your job as an actor, these are actor tricks I'm giving all the actors listening right now, your job is to do whatever they tell you to do. And if you do it, I mean, if they say go left, go hard left. If they tell you to do it with a Russian accent, I mean, just come out and do like fool, like Boris Badenov, like all completely Boris, go crazy with the accent. Uh, and there is no wrong way when you have a cold script. And by the way, I'd learned that uh, from failing a number of times with cold scripts. Um, but um, they said, we want you to play this role of this young quarterback that's in the script. And he's from Odessa, Texas. This was like right around the time of like Friday Night Lights. So, man, I, I went in there and I just like completely like did like a full like Texas. I mean, full on. And I just thought like. I'm just going to do an imitation of Sam Elliott. I'm just going to do Sam Elliott. Like, how would Sam, what would, like, WWSD, what would Sam do? And I did a complete Sam Elliott imitation and tried to go completely calm around Tom Cruise, who was for, sort of frenetic and being Jerry Maguire in these scenes. And, uh, and, and I got the role. And it really changed my career. I mean, you know, that was an Oscar nominated. I mean, Cuba Gooding Jr. won the Oscar. You know, the screenplay or something else was nominated. A few things were nominated, and um, and it was a hot movie. Yeah, when it came out. And uh, that, I'm sorry, it took me so long to tell that story, but uh, it's just it was like just like right time, right place stuff. And at that point, I had auditioned so many times and done a lot of bad auditions that. I knew when put on the spot in an audition and told to read a brand new scene, I knew exactly what to do. It's And it's funny. So while I was a young guy, I was 22, um, I wasn't green at that point. I had done thousands of commercial auditions and done enough bad auditions to know that when someone gave you a new script exactly what to do you know it was uh it was funny uh, i knew the tricks well it's hard to understand uh but people say failure is the key to success yeah it's it's funny i remember um i had auditioned for a tv pilot before that about a car that has superpowers like a new night rider show it's so funny. They had given me, I came in there and I had prepared for one role. There was like two young men who find a supercar in a junkyard. And I had prepared for one role. And when I went in there to screen test, they said, no, 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 we, we don't want you to do this role. We we want you to do the other role. And I don't really remember, but one was like the nerd guy and one was the cool guy. And I think I was auditioning for the cool guy or maybe I was auditioning for the nerd guy. And when they gave me the other part, I didn't know what to do. I didn't prepare for it. And I remember afterwards, um, my agent called me up and was like, what did you do? They said you were really nervous and you were stammering in there and you didn't do it. And I should have like not, 
cared. Like I should have like, and if I played the cool guy, I should have done it like, hey, Fonzie, like, ooh, hey, you know, played it cool. Or if I was playing the nerd guy, I should have uh, like really like nerded it up. And, uh, you know, and I knew after that point to never do that when given a cold script again, you know. And it's so funny, the next cold script I was given was in the audition for Jerry Maguire. So everything happens for a reason, I guess. We'll be back for more in a moment. I don't want to bum everybody out um, listening or watching this, but I'm a little bit of a failed actor. You know, I, um, I, uh, I, I acted for many years. I was acting, I was acting. I still um, continue to act, but it's funny. I, uh, my acting career um, has gone through a couple of downturn, downturns, you know? And currently, I'm in an acting downturn. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. When you meet Tom Cruise, you're thinking the whole time, I can't believe this is Tom Cruise. Is this real life? It's almost like it, it's surreal. I mean, I don't care. I, I, I would even, I, I would imagine even Barack Obama. I, I, I mean, uh, 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 King Charles meeting Tom Cruise. It's got to be like... Whoa. How about being a talk show host now? You yeah. have to be yourself. That's different than having a script. Yeah, it's uh it's it's interesting. I um I I, I gotta give a shout out to my really good friend Horatio Sands, who's an actor who was on Saturday Night Live for many years, uh, who told me uh, we did a movie together in two thousand and he said to me, You should go to um improv school. Um, everybody's doing it. And I was like, improv school? I'm already I'm already on TV. Like, uh, I'm going back to school? And he's like, you should always go back to school. And I went and I've... Uh, I went to Upright Citizens Brigade, which is an improv uh, theater school here in Los Angeles, here in... also in New York. They, they probably have a school in, in Chicago as well. Um, sorry, I don't know the exact details, of, but Upright Citizens Brigade... Uh, is an improv school I, I went to and uh, I did all their classes and um, have performed a number of times with um, them. And uh, it was funny. It was right when uh, sort of um, improvisation was really becoming uh, quite popular on television. Uh, shows like The Office and everything, you know, where things were lightly scripted you know curb your enthusiasm these are things that are lightly scripted were becoming sort of uh all the rage and um it really like improv really teaches you to just for me what it taught me was to basically just listen to other people to listen to what everybody's saying um to not listen to yourself to listen to others and to try and feed off of that. And uh, I've really lucked into this uh, uh, job on on the talk because, uh, you know, they're not making as many scripted shows as they used to, which is why I moved to Los Angeles. You know, I was in a TV show for NBC, a what they call a procedural, a cop show. Uh, you know, I was in... Uh, um, uh, like I, I came out here to work in TV as an actor and I never thought I would be a talk show host. And uh, thank God I, it, you know, it was something that I could do. I didn't go in blind um, because it's, uh, it, it, it's really been uh, a great job for me. I really enjoy it. It's, do you like working every day? You know, it's, it's, I've never, I, I, I've had a couple of TV shows where I, I have to say, even on a TV show, you don't go to the same place every day. You shoot on location, you're shooting all over town. I've never come to the same place every day for four years. It's crazy. You know, what's really interesting to me is, um, and, and you can probably speak on this, is you really get a feeling for the industry because everyone else's shows come to you. Like you really see what's working and what's not these days. And I mean, this is no secret, but 
uh, everyone has an unscripted show these days. Like it's amazing to me how um how many unscript how many unscripted shows there are really. You know, scripted shows have become and when I say scripted I mean like, you know, shows that require shows that are fiction, fiction shows, you know, not that unscripted shows are are unfiction. They're just as fiction as the as the uh, fiction shows really but um it's amazing to me how much programming is reality reality makes you sound old you know uh, how unscripted shows are is that the new term unscripted rather than reality i think that's the fancy term that yeah, yeah. and i think you don't want to offend reality show stars it's beneath them to call the Kardashians reality show stars. They're they're unscripted people. Performers. <laughs> <laughs> but um it's amazing to me how um and I I'll tell you what's funny, in my household, you know, with my wife and my children we really only watch unscripted television. It's all we watch. It's all we watch. You know, what I'm finding, too, is... I was just talking about this with my brother. Uh, nowadays, I, he has a, a young man who lives with him uh, who's in his 30s. And I was trying to talk to him the other day about a show I was watching, and he doesn't watch television. Yeah. At all. Yeah. Well, what do you do? What do you talk about when you go to work? I mean... Yeah, I guess these days everybody talks about politics. That's uh that's a hot topic yeah. that everybody talks about. That's uh that's a big one. Um But I can remember when I when I would go to work or go to school, you talked about what you saw on television the night before. That's all we had. It's really funny. I uh I I mean, uh people talk about podcasts a lot. Um I I enjoy a lot of podcasts. I um I I, I listen to them a lot. I I I watch them a lot. Um, it is interesting. I mean, people. Uh, I, I mean, you know, yeah, you're right. Everyone talked about what happened. Who kissed who on moonlighting? Will Maddie and uh, and and Dave, Maddie and Dave, right? Uh, Maddie and Dave. That, that that was their names at moonlighting. Ever get together? You know, will. Uh, you know, I guess Scandal. Everybody talked about what happened on Scandal the night before. Um, you know, uh, I, I, people binge shows and watch them, you know. But um, I do have to say, like, you know, take a take a streaming service like Netflix. You know, while they do have their, you know, squid games that everybody talks about. They do have their Love is Blinds that everybody talks about, you know. I mean. The Crown. You know, The Crown. Crown's a good one. The Crown's one that, that I watch. Yeah. That's a real one. That's a real that's a real show. That that is a show with a budget. That's a real show. Yeah. I still have not But it's it's so funny. You you watch it on your own terms. I still have not watched the last 6 episodes. Man, I got to tell you, they did some things in The Crown. I mean, all right, let's let's talk about The Crown. When they brought, and this is not a spoiler alert, but when they brought Lady Di back uh, after uh, uh, Princess Di has passed, when they brought her back with Charles, with... The Queen. With Dodie. Oh, uh, the, with uh, 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 Dodie Fayette. Oh, gosh. Who's the dad? Is it Dodie? You know, it's uh, Al Fayed. Uh, yeah. Something Al Fayed. Yeah. Brought her back with Al Fayed brought her back with the queen when the queen's going to bed that was i was like this is tv on another level and it's so well done so well done because we all know the story yes yeah and still they're bringing a fresh sort of take to it that was appointment television that was really good so it's and it was so well cast really incredible but it, it <sighs> It doesn't seem to me everybody's talking about it, you know? I mean, that's only you and I. Like, 
If I went to work and, you know, sat in a room full of the kids that I work with, hey, who watched The Crown last night? No one's raising their hand, you know? It's only... Come meet my family. They'll yeah. all talk to you about it. Yeah. They were all pretty hooked on it. What, do, what would you say is the uh, craziest experience you've had? Um, I'd say the most surreal was... Um, uh, the most upsetting was... Uh, uh, you know, and I wasn't in the... I wasn't, you know, in Hollywood when it happened. I was in college. But when River Phoenix passed away, that was... Uh, tragic insane um uh still not over it uh craziest experience i've had let me really think about that okay what about uh fan experiences have you had any crazy wild um i don't really have like a, a rabid fan base they do my wife does get fan letters at our home address which is crazy so someone has access to our home address and like sends letters and a lot of times they're from prisoners because uh, you can tell they're from prisoners because it says like their prisoner number you have to address you know when you put the return address you put your prisoner number on there so that's pretty surreal um uh fyi prisoners who are sending my wife mail um i read it i never give it to my wife uh <laughs> It sort of is pretty exciting for me. I really feel like I'm uh, reading reading into something I shouldn't be reading. Um, there's a takeaway from this podcast. Uh, I read my wife's prison fan mail. Um, it's sort of like prison erotica for me. Um, uh, what's a cra like for me? Crazy experience. Um, you know. Uh, I guess uh, there, there, there. I can't give you like one experience. Like this crazy thing happened to me, um, but I have realized you cannot control a career. A career happens. It's funny. I see, I, I, I see um, younger people, specifically through social media, attempting to like put stuff out and control where they're going and like say like this is what i want for my career and really gunning for stuff gunning for um directions that careers will go into and um you can't control it you, you, like my suggest like the craziest thing to me is you have to be open to the universe and then you somehow end up still being here it, it it's it's funny that that to me is the craziest, I, I think, experience as a whole is that you really have no control over careers. Uh, you can do a great job. You can show up. You cannot be drunk at work. You can um, be prepared. But really, you have no control over how long it lasts, where you're going with it. Um or where it's going. Right. It's, you know, not, it's not like in, in, I'll say, the real world where, you know, it's not how many words dictation you can take or how fast you type or how good you are with numbers. It's all has to do with somebody else's opinion and impression of you and, and how yeah, you're doing. Yeah, you know, I don't want to bum everybody out um, listening or watching this, but I'm a little bit of a failed actor. You know, I... Um, I uh, I, I acted for many years. I was acting. I was acting. I still um, continue to act. But it's funny. I uh, m My acting career um, has gone through a couple of downturn downturns, you know. And currently, I'm in an acting downturn. And um, luckily, um, my representation has stayed with me. And my representation are the ones who said, um, hey, someone, a seat just opened up on this show, The Talk. You should um, you should go for that seat. And it's funny, when you hear that, your first reaction is, I'm not doing a talk show, I'm an actor. Like, that's not why I, I hired you as my agent. I hired you as my agent to get me acting gigs. And luckily, I was open enough to the universe to say, oh yeah, I can... 
I can sit there for a month or two, you know, they need someone. And then uh, I guess I did a good job for a month or two because they said, we'd like to hire you to uh, a multi-year contract and pay you money to do this and you'll have a job. <laughs> and um, so it, I, I, I think the most astonishing to, thing to me is how I have no control over my professional life. That's crazy. That's crazy because I thought coming in here as a young man, I was in con like, I control everything. I, I'm in charge of where I go. I'm in charge of me. I'm in charge of me. I'm going to decide whether I'm acting or not. And I'll stop acting when I say I'm stopping acting. Steve, I have no control of anything. But you have something that other people don't in this town, and that's some stability. You know, if you're signed to a four or five year contract, you know you're going to get a check for a while. I have stability currently right now, but really I have no stability in the long run. I mean, I just don't. I That's what I'm trying to say. I have I I have no control of Look this at thing. It from the other side. Yeah, it's um that that to me has been the most uh I I wish I knew that when I was younger coming out here to calm down a little bit, you know, when things didn't work out. I have a manager that I've been with for coming up on 30 years, man. That's a long time. Yeah, it is. Um, I have a manager who I was in a TV show that got canceled. I was acting in a TV show that got canceled almost immediately. And um, this is really when TV and like right before streaming where shows were getting canceled like left and right. And I was in like three or four of them in a row. And I was like, what am I, what am I doing wrong here? Like, what am I doing wrong here? And my manager... Uh, said to me, um, "Hey man, you're you're gonna end up where you end up. Uh, I don't I don't know where that is, but you're gonna end up where you end up." And I didn't really listen to him at the time, but he, it's such a great piece of advice. You're gonna end up where you end up. You know, <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. It's 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 so funny. That to me is the most. Uh, you, getting back, to, and I'm sorry it took me a half hour to answer this question. What's like something that shocked you or what's been something that was surprising um, that I have no control? That's good to know. Uh, I would consider something that was crazy that you talked about earlier. And I mean, this is a good crazy, but meeting Tom Cruise and having a conversation with him when you didn't expect to, you know, that's kind of crazy. But a good crazy. Yeah. As it turns out. Yeah, I don't, I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. When you meet Tom Cruise, you're thinking the whole time, I can't believe this is Tom Cruise. Is this real life? It's almost like it, it's surreal. I mean, I don't care. I, I, I would even, I, I would imagine even Barack Obama, I, I, I mean, uh, uh, King Charles meeting Tom Cruise, it's got to be like, whoa. Especially if you want to be an actor or you are an actor and... You have dreams for yourself. I, you know, going on all these junkets that I did back in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, meeting some people, you know, you walk in and it's like seeing a statue or like seeing some kind of a monument. Oh, my God, that's Barbara Streisand, you know, that's Betty Davis, you know. And, and then I know what you're, you're, you're saying, to sit down and actually get to ask them questions. Yeah. Which is fascinating to me. Yeah. Yeah. It is funny, and listen, uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I tip my hat to what you have to do. You have basically a five-minute window to uh, get someone to say something entertaining about the project that they're trying to sell, and a lot of times you're eliciting stuff out of them, and you have to make it like you've known them for years, and it's, uh, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's interesting. Um, me working on this show, the talk. Um, a lot of my job, half of my job is interviewing uh, celebs, we'll call them, coming in and selling whatever project they're selling. I mean, they're only coming to us if they have something that they're selling. And um, because it's a live show, I, uh, a, big, uh, a big problem for me is asking the questions I'm supposed to ask on the clock because we got to go to commercial and I get into a lot of trouble uh, going off topic. If somebody says something, uh, I sort of go down that road. And 
I'd run out of time to say, oh my gosh, you have a movie that's coming out on Friday and... Um, and we'll be back. Yeah, and I've I, I've gotten in trouble a couple times. So it's funny, like you just saying like, you know, I did junkets for all those years. Like, and I'm sure you have like a set amount of time with these people. I really... Uh, it's, Fortunately, uh, uh, if you were a lo local station, sometimes they would give you three minutes two minutes yeah. what can you get out of a person yeah. in that amount of time just go fortunately fast. i worked for cbs which yeah. had a little more clout right and e entertainment television yeah. we had a little more you know we, we were the target we had the target audience yeah. so they gave us more time we'd have 10 or 15 minutes yeah and then if you interview somebody like uh, Whoopi goldberg was always a favorite of mine and very good to me and sometimes we'd be talking there, there was one the long walk home i think was the movie i was talking to her about and um, I said, we're out of time. I got to stop because they're giving me the rap. And she said, I, she turned around to her camera and said, I know they are. And it's making me mad. It's so funny. so they, they, they just said, go ahead, go ahead, Steve. Yeah. Keep asking, you know, those, Hilarious. those were great when those yeah. happened. So it's been, that's been a, um, it's a, it's a skill that I don't have yet. It's, it's a skill. Yeah. We'll be back in a moment. But you go through some abject uh, unemployment, years of unemployment, you know, and it's uh, it's scary. I'm really fortunate to be married to someone who um, stays uh, very busy. Can you remember when and why you were at your lowest point? Um, my Come lowest... on, Jerry, give me some dirt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, kidding, I'm kidding. No, uh, my lowest point, I would say, is... Uh, um, uh, and I can only speak as an actor because I don't know, I've never really done anything else, but you go through some abject, uh, unemployment, years of unemployment, you know, and it's, uh, it's scary. I'm really fortunate to be married to someone who, um, uh, stays, uh, very busy and, um. I realized later on in our relationship, I, I've been with my wife for 20 years, maybe over 20 years now. And it's funny, early on when we were going out and even married, I, I went through years of, uh, Steve, what we call abject unemployment. And um, it's scary. You got two little kids and you're not working. But I, I've realized like when my wife is not working, for some reason... I pick up the slack and when I'm working, when I'm not working, somehow my wife picks up the slack. It's, it's funny. It, uh, uh I, I'd say my lowest point was, um, I mean, I, I, I hate to, uh, make it about work cause there's so much more to life than that, but, um, it's scary when you're not working and you have bills, you know, it's, uh, and you think you and you thought you'd be working for a long time, so you went out and bought that nice car or the house, yeah, or whatever. I, you know, I never really overspent. I was never like that, but uh, I, I, uh, I just, um, you need money. You know, you need. Yes, I know. You need things. Um, it's, uh, it's funny. I, uh, I'd say abject unemployment is, uh, is a low point. You know. Hey, do you have a Hollywood hero? You know, I look at someone like uh, Martin Short, and Martin Short has been doing this for decades, and he's just as relevant today as he was when he first came on the scene. Um, I, I look at someone like um, David Allen Greer, mm -hmm. and David Allen Greer can be in uh, Academy Award nominated films. He can be in sketch comedy shows. Uh, he can he do can it all. He can announce the Oscars. He can announce the Oscars really well. He does it all. I look at someone like Wayne Brady. Uh. He hosts game shows. He's on Broadway. He does it all I, I i it's it's so funny there's no um it, it, i think it's the people who um are, are are not just um 
who don't just do one thing. I think it's the people who um, keep it keep it moving, keep it interesting. Um, you know, uh, some of my proudest moments personally have been when I've been on Broadway. I mean, it's so funny. As an actor, uh, you always feel like, oh man, I'm just a TV actor. They're going to, I'm a fraud. They all know it. I'm just, I played a cop on a procedural TV show. They can tell I'm a cheesy actor, you know. Uh, got lucky with that Stand By Me and that Jerry Maguire. I'm just a cheesy guy. Um, Any minute now they're going to find out. They're, they, they all know. I can tell by the way they're looking at me. But when you've done Broadway a couple times, um, you know they can't say that, you know. Um, so uh, those to me are uh, um, those to me are the actors. You know, I I got to do a Broadway show with uh, David Allen Greer, so getting to watch him work, uh, be on stage with him for hundreds of performances is uh, is something else. He won a Tony for that play. Uh, um, so yeah, those are the those are the people that I really look up to, and also your ability to keep Whoopi Goldberg uh, in uh, in an interview when you're only at 15 minutes, but Whoopi says, <laughs> "Let him go, keep uh, going." It's pissing me off. Let him go. <laughs> That's what she said. Um, and, or share. <laughs> She's great, but she can be tough. Oh really? Yeah. We had a, a little experience once. The first time I interviewed her. I'll tell the story. Yeah, she please. tells it on television all the time. I, I came here to hear your stories. It. She, uh, I was sitting there, uh, and I said to her, you're not at all what I expected. You're kind of soft-spoken. You're very thoughtful in oh. your responses. And she cut me off, and she said, well, fuck with me and see what ah, happens. Yeah, exactly. I thought that story was going to end with her slapping you, saying, no, snap no, out of it. No, <laughs> no. And, and she's given me, me, she's been terrific to me. Yeah. Uh, and some sometimes, you know, she in one of my interviews, she called Madonna the C word okay. on camera. Yeah. And it made front page news in Britain, in great in the UK, yeah, that's, the tabloids. Uh, that's. Uh, and then every time I saw her after that, she'd say, you're the one who got me into so much trouble. Well, oh, yeah. you said it. Right. Um, <laughs> that's uh, crazy. She's, she's the best. Yeah, that's that's a funny. Hey, share. There's uh, someone who uh, has has done it all, you know, and lasted. Yeah, still here, Hollywood. That's oh my Cher. gosh, Academy Awards, v v variety shows, uh, infomercials where she made a ton of money. Um, yeah, all when of people it. were telling her you're selling yourself out. Yeah, it's funny. I had a good buddy who uh, who told me be open to the universe and that's how I really try to live live my life I try to be open to the universe so when I get an email from you saying hey I'm doing a podcast yeah I'll be there I'm open to the universe great and we appreciate it uh maybe I'll sign this one off by saying you had me at goodbye okay <laughs> Okay, I like that. Maybe that can be your your uh, sign off. I used to work with a woman who was a uh, who I loved dearly. She was a producer at E, and she had the the only thing that kind of got to me was she was constantly cheerful, so cheerful. Yeah. And I'm not a kind of cheerful, sure. you know, perpetual. And so I'd say, Sonia, you had me at goodbye. Right, right. <laughs> was, I like and she that. gave me a when I left. She gave me a. A frame, a picture frame with a picture of the two of us in it, and she had it engraved. You had me at goodbye. That's really funny. So, thanks, Jerry. Thank I appreciate you. It. I really enjoyed that. Oh, thanks. So did I. Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All things technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein.